Good morning. Welcome to Independent Methodist Church. Today is Sunday, the 5th, 2020. Participating in this service, organist Ann Long, lector Sherry Donnelly, also the video photographer Shane Donnelly. A letter will go out to the congregation on Monday. Sunday school continues to meet for the adults with the guest teacher, Stephanie Mize, offering a series on women of the Bible. And there is Bible study Wednesdays at 12 noon. It is good that you are with us. weekend as we celebrate our nation's independence, I want to bring to your attention how the Christian faith and the Bible were brought into the great buildings in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Now when we go to the headquarters of our government, the Capitol building, as soon as you walk through the front door, there's a rotunda a big circular area and on all the walls are paintings, paintings of great events in American history. And several of them are related to our Christian faith. Christopher Columbus, making his discovery of America, called the island on which he first settled San Salvador, meaning Holy Savior. He claimed it for the Savior Christ. And you see that there's priests joining with Columbus. They have flags with crosses, and they are kneeling in prayer, thanking the Lord for this new land. Much later, the pilgrims of our Thanksgiving holiday, they were aboard the Mayflower, sailing for the new world. They gathered for prayer, and of course, the minister is reading from the Bible. In the first English settlement, Jamestown, the Indian princess Pocahontas became a Christian and she was baptized by the pastor at the baptismal font. And this we find at the main entrance of our Capitol building. Now when we go to Washington, we have great monuments to our presidents, Washington, Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln. And here is the Lincoln Monument, the Washington Monument, George Washington. And at one time, this was the largest structure in the world. And how the money came in to build this monument to Washington, Sunday school classes. Children would make donations and they would specify that they wanted a particular Bible verse. So if we would walk all the stairs to the very top, we will see that on the walls there are Bible verses. And at the very top of the monument, in Latin, the words, Los Deo, meaning, praise be to God. And we also find Bible verses at the memorial for Thomas Jefferson, 
and Bible verses for Abraham Lincoln. And one that I'm sharing with you, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. From John 8, 32. And the last thing that I bring to your attention, Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia, was once unsettled. It was farmland. And a French designer, he had international fame as a city planner, Pierre Charles Lafont, he drew a city plan for all of these buildings with streets named for the states. And if you use your imagination at the map, look. Do you see the cross? Do you see the cross? And looking at the cross, we find the Washington Monument, Capitol Building, the Lincoln and the Jefferson Memorials, and of course, parks and pools of water. So these are some of the discoveries that we make about our Christian heritage and how it influenced the early days of our country. And to remind you as to how the church and the Bible were brought into our Christian faith in America's capital, I'm giving you your ornament put on your Christmas tree of the Washington Monument. I hope that you're enjoying this holiday weekend and we will see you next Sunday. The selected verses from the scriptures for Independence Day. I am reading from the King James Version Bible. The word of God is found in the book of Exodus chapter 20 verses 5 and 6 from the Ten Commandments. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and to the third and fourth generations of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. The book of Judge, Judges, chapter 2, verses 7 and 10, and chapter 21, verse 25. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. The book of Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14. The Lord God said to King Solomon, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Psalm 144, verse 15. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs, chapter 22, verse 28. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Proverbs 30, verse 12. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their faith filthiness. The Epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 30 through 32. Chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. The Apostle Paul counseled. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, 
forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is the word of the Lord. During a vacation Bible school, Jimmy in kindergarten missed the correct words when leading his group in a recitation of a Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, but he caught the right spirit. The little tyke put his hand over his heart and blurted out, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of a miracle. Our nation is truly a miracle from God. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. Back in the 1990s, there was a national advertising blitz of signs from God. From coast to coast, billboards featured a white or a black background with a one-line statement signed from God. Recall the caption, America, land that I love, sign God. Beneath in small print, remember me? Has America forgotten God? A middle school in Kentucky was scheduled to perform a staged version of the 1965 TV special, A Charlie Brown Christmas. And due to a single complaint over Linus's recitation of Luke 2, 8 through 14, the story of the angelic message to the Bethlehem shepherds, the Johnson County schools deleted the scene from the play. During the show, parents in the auditorium interrupted the program and read aloud the scriptures. Also in Kentucky, a school teacher for a door decoration contest displayed lioness holding his blanket beside the Charlie Brown tree with the first line from Luke. And there were in the same country shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. Merry Christmas. She was condemned by the administration for imposing her personal beliefs on the students, demanding the removal of the poster. Ryan Brown at the Washington Community High School outside Peoria, Illinois, was to lead a student-initiated prayer for a graduation ceremony. The 80-year tradition received a restraining order from a federal judge prohibiting a prayer at the commencement. Guess what? Brown prearranged with his class that he would sneeze and all would respond, God bless you. Making the national news, the East Liverpool, Ohio school had a custom of singing the Lord's Prayer at graduation exercises. The Freedom From Religion Foundation in Wisconsin got wind to the plan and bullied the school through an activist judge to stop this illegal activity. The decree prevented the singing of the Lord's Prayer. The assembly outwitted the court and as an act of disobedience, all recited in unison the prayer of Jesus. These are examples of a widespread, pervasive, and concerted campaign at every level in society to expunge not only Christianity, but God from the life of the nation. A frog will immediately hop out of hot water, but if placed in a kettle with a temperature gradually turned up, the amphibian accommodates to the heat, unaware that it is being boiled to death. And isn't this what we have witnessed unfold in our country? Politically correct governmental leaders, educators, and the media have intentionally 
downplayed or negated altogether the importance Christianity played in the formation of the Republic. And this Antichrist spirit has been able to pull off their deception because not only do we have low information voters, we find that we have low information Christians who do not understand their own Christian background. A father had a conference with his son's teacher. Opening the grade book, the teacher showed the kid was failing in history. Dad dismissed the poor grades, commenting, history, I was never good at it either. Well, replied the teacher, I see history is repeating itself. The only thing that we learn from history is that we don't learn anything from history. And why does it keep repeating itself when it doesn't have to? When Patrick Henry delivered his stirring oration, give me liberty or give me death, he was standing behind a pulpit. When Paul Revere made his famous midnight ride alerting the British are coming, the signal one lantern if by land and two if by sea, was positioned in the Old North Church of Boston. Francis Hopkinson, a signer of the Declaration of Independence and the designer of our Stars and Stripes flag, was a full-time church musician. Nathan Hale was captured by the British and hanged as a spy for the American cause. His last words before execution are immortal. I regret that I have but one life to give for my country. Hale was a seminary student, leaving his course of studies to assist for the drive for independence. When the British occupied Philadelphia, the Patriots feared that the famed Liberty Bell would be seized and melted down to make a cannon. The bell was transported and hidden in the Zion Reformed Church in Alatine for the duration of the war. Of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, John Witherspoon from New Jersey, a Presbyterian, was the only credentialed clergy among this assembly in Philadelphia. Wannabe President Al Gore has the same degree bestowed on me, an MDiv, a Master in Divinity. Gal, Gore planned to go into the ministry of the Presbyterian Church, but after commencement moved into politics. 29 of the 56 signers of the Declaration, like Al Gore, held seminary degrees, but did not pursue ordination. Most of the colleges in the colonies were church-related to train men for ministry. Also, among the signers, there were PKs, preacher's kids, sons of pastors raised in a parsonage, and others were married to women, daughters of a preacher man. At least two dozen of the signers were active lay leaders on the board, session, or vestry of their local congregations. Upon investigation into the lives of the architects of our document of freedom, we find men who were frequent at worship, financially supported their church, were known to pray and read the book of books and openly discuss their faith. Is this not the same criteria that we use to evaluate where an individual stands as expressing a vital and active faith and participation in a parish? Christianity had a pivotal role in the formation of our nation. For some time, the liberal elite think tank driving contemporary society has imposed its revisions of the past with an indoctrination that the Founding Fathers were not traditional Protestants 
but were deists. The God of the leadership of the Continental Congress and the war effort held to a vague concept of God without supernatural intervention, unable or unwilling to answer prayer and perform miracles. According to these elites, the God of the Founding Fathers was not the God of the Bible. Deities take their name from deity, meaning God. God was compared to a divine watchmaker who designed the universe, set it in motion, and disassociated himself from it. According to this new spin, the first patriots were Christian in name only, but in actuality rejected the Protestant denominations of their upbringing. Agreed, deism influenced the thought of a few of these men, especially Thomas Jefferson, and it is unclear where Jefferson stood in relationship to Christ and organized religion. The last paragraph of the Declaration reads in part, We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions and for the support of this Declaration with a firm resolution on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. How can we rely on the supernatural protection if there is no God capable of coming through for our defense? How can one make a pledge of sacred honor if there is nothing holy? If there is no God, or if God is way out there and uninvolved with us, what good is it to call upon him to be the ultimate judge of affairs on earth? Creator, supreme judge of the world, providence and holiness are attributes of God lifted from a Sunday school catechism. We are left to answer the question, are these words on a piece of paper communicating an empty literary flair, or did this body of men convey deeply held personal religious convictions? The mention of Creator, Providence, and Supreme Judge in the Declaration were just pious platitudes, and the delegates had to put them in the writing in order to keep their constituents back home very happy. Or, another possibility is yes, John Hancock and the other men went on record subscribing to belief in God, but this was due to the fact that they are not as enlightened as we are today, and unfortunately voiced the irrationality of the day. If these patriots were alive in 2020, they would be non-believers, demonstrating a superior intelligence. Outrightly rejected by the left is a proposal that the Founding Fathers were committed Christians. Providence is the affirmation that God is moving everything together for ultimate meaning and the fulfillment of His purposes. Humans are forever rebelling and frustrating the will of God, and the devil gets in there with his disruption, but the Lord has the ability to overrule any scheme devised by man or demon. The outcome of the drive for independence was placed by the Continental Congress into the hands of God, and the hardships imposed on these signers was unknown. But this assembly went on record that all was released to his divine decision-making. The great seal of the United States appearing on our currency features the all-seeing eye of God within a triangle, a Christian symbol 
of divine providence. The stars on the U.S. flag stood for God creating a new constellation in the heavens under his watchful care. Providence implies that all things are under the complete control of God, standing in opposition to this idea of chance. And here's something to consider. Is this happenstance? Thomas Jefferson and John Adams accredited for doing most of the writing of the Declaration died on the same day of the same year, a Sunday, the 4th of July, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. How do you pull that off? Noah Webster in the eulogy that he gave for these founding fathers commented that for such an unusual occurrence it had to be an indication of divine providence a sign from God of his favor on these men their undertaking and the legacy they have left for our nation and Christianity was carried over into the writing of our Constitution. The Constitution stipulates that the new president is to be inaugurated on the 20th of January. If the 20th falls on a Sunday, it is to be moved to a Monday. When Congress passes a bill to be signed by the president to be made into law, if the chief executive fails to sign it or to use his veto power, it automatically goes into effect after 10 days. The Constitution specifies that in the counting of the 10 days, Sundays are exempt. Inquiring minds want to know why is Sunday not included in the arithmetic? One guess. From the very beginning of our republic, the federal government shuts down and does no business on Sunday, the Christian Sabbath. Our forefathers gave priority to the Lord's Day, encouraging Americans to be in the Lord's house with the Lord's people. National elections are held the first Tuesday in November with these new office holders mandated to report to duty in Washington, not the beginning of the new year in January, but on the first Monday in December when Congress opens its new session. Isn't it unusual to initiate a new business year in early December? Why not January? The wives of the first patriots wanted the Senate, the House, the courts, and their staff to be in town for the many parties, promenades, and celebrations which go with Christmas. By use of the Christian calendar and the reckoning of time, our Constitution underscores the central role of Christ in civilization. John Adams said that the two most important days for Americans are December 25th and July 4th. The Battle Hymn of the Republic finds us proclaiming he is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Is it too late? Have we gone too far? Abraham Lincoln called the United States an almost chosen people. His greatest concern was not whether God was on the side of America, but if America was on the side of God. The future survival of the United States will not ultimately be dependent on an act of Congress, the decision of the Supreme Court, the finances of the Department of the Treasury, 
the military capability of the Pentagon or having the right man in the White House, but to be determined by the king of the universe. One nation under God has become a nation without God. President Ronald Reagan warned, if we do not remember that we are one nation under God, we shall become one nation gone under. General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, sent two officers into the inner city to set up operations for evangelism and outreach. After months of labor, these ministers were frustrated unable to make any inroads into the community. Experiencing frustration, these fellows wrote to General Booth for counsel. What do you want us to do? He sent them a telegram consisting of the words, why don't you try crying? Have we emitted a single tear for the shape that our country is in? I see a lot of anger, I see a lot of lobbying, I see a lot of political activity. We grieve the deplorable state of this nation. And what is the church and the people of God doing? Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet because he shed a continual cascade of tears over depraved Jerusalem. Our hearts should be broken. We should cry out to the Lord to change things. And we need to begin changing with our churches and beginning with ourselves. The Lord said to King Solomon, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, as a nation, we are learning that lawlessness is the result of godlessness. As a people, we have turned our back on your commandments, ignore your claims, and choose, chosen a materialistic, irreligious way of life. For while public worship declines and the churches become emptier, crime and wickedness increase, and the prisons are full to overflowing. Father, have mercy upon us, revive your work in our land, and grant to us as a people true repentance and a living faith in Christ the Lord. Amen. Lord God Almighty, in whose name the founders of this country won liberty for themselves and for us, and lit the torch of freedom for nations then unborn, grant that we and all the people of this land may have the grace to maintain our liberties in righteousness and peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm.